welcome. Well, the eclipse has come and gone. And we, as a church, are still here. Not that I thought that we were going to get raptured, but I thought we could have been raptured at the eclipse. Amen. I thought, what a great time for God to take his bride home when the entire United States was looking up at the sun, S-U-N, and the church would look up and see the sun, S-O-N, and hear the trumpet calling us home. Amen. Well, we are still here, which means we still have a job to do. And though the rest of the world is looking for signs and wonders through the eclipse, and we know that Jesus is the son, as it says in the scriptures, the son, S-U-N, of righteousness with healing in his wings. The S-U-N, the brightness of God's glory, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. We know that he is the bright and morning star. And no shadow can eclipse the brightness of the glory of God. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, I've got a study today, a little message that I just, it just thrills my heart. And I have, as always, God gave me the perfect story, the perfect visual for what I'm about to share with you. So this study is called it's story time it's story time now generally speaking testimony time in churches is very predictable we would announce that there's going to be a short time of testimonies and you begin to see people kind of fertilely looking for something to remember, something from the week that they can share in church I know God did something what was that thing that God did or there's someone who shares a story who remembers something and they stand up boldly and they share. Then there are others where we get that, that great thank you for my, I just want to thank God for my salvation. I just want to thank God for my salvation. But then every once in a while, there's an account of answered prayer and praise to God. And I want to talk about the story time of testimonies. Now, please, please, please don't turn it off because you think, oh, testimony, testify. What God showed me about Adam and Eve and the story is beautiful. So if you'll just hang with me, this is going to be an exciting study. So let me start you off in Psalm 66. This is Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Wow. Come here, all you who fear God. That's all of you who are watching and listening. All of you who are tuned in at this moment by divine appointment. I have a story to tell you. Uh, this is a phenomenal story. I mean, it, it just... It just speaks volumes to God and the gloriousness with which he lives through us in this world. So when we have the opportunity to express the amazing, majestic power, the sweet answer of prayer, the love of God, we, it, it's a privilege. Now, we may not look at it as a privilege, but it is the highlight for me, it is the highlight when someone calls and, and says, I, I, have a, I have a story to tell. I, I have a, something to share. I, I, I love God stories, and we call them God stories. Does anybody have a God story to share? Is there a glorious moment from this week that you would like to share with God, with us from God? Now, they don't have to be testimonies of walking on water or, or things like that because well, let me, let me get there. Let me get there. So certain personalities lend themselves to sharing in church. I understand that. That there are some who just find it hard to stand up and publicly declare the goodness of God. But we are obligated. We are obligated to share our stories about God. We, we have an obligation. Every believer has a responsibility to declare the works of God. 
A basic definition of testify or testimony means to declare or acknowledge under oath. It's just telling the truth. It's just declaring a truth over your life. Who can forget these words of, the, of Jesus when the Pharisees came to him and they said to him, you need to tell your disciples to stop talking about you. You need to tell them to just close their mouths and stop talking about what you do and who you are. And Jesus says, this is in the book of Luke. This is Luke chapter 19, verse 40. Luke 19, verse 40. And Jesus responds to the Pharisees and says, I tell you that even if these would keep silence, the stones would immediately cry out. Now that word caught my attention. Immediately cry out. If they don't, if the disciples didn't, didn't declare anything about Jesus, Jesus said the rocks would immediately cry out. See, this is what I think testifying is all about. It's immediate. It is not something that you save until Sunday or you save until the following month when you're having a testimony time at church. The rocks would cry out immediately because they could hardly wait to testify about the creator. I wonder if we have that urgency in us. I wonder if we have that spontaneous, passionate urgency when something happens in our lives that can only be attributed to God. Can we have that same immediacy about our testimony? Or do we think, oh, I'll wait and save it. Oh, listen, it burns inside of me when he does something that I cannot wait to share it with somebody. You see, for the natural world, they are inarticulate when it comes to talking about God unless they're using it, his name in a defaming way. But God gave us a tongue for the purpose of declaring his glory with great precision, right? Now, there are some principles found in this verse of Psalm 66, verse 16, that I want to talk to you about because this is going to make it easy for you to stand up. It, it's going to make it so easy. And so it says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. First thing, a worthy testimony must be fresh. It can't be something only that happened a year ago. That's not an immediate fresh testimony. This psalm writer said, come in here. I, I want to declare what he has done for my soul. This is something that was here. Um, if you read through the whole chapter of, of Psalm 66, you will find that there is a principle that underlies this whole verse about declaring. You see, in verses 1 to 4, it's really evident that the writer of the psalm knows the scriptures. He knows what God is doing. It is ever present in him. In verses 5 through 7, he declares the works of what God has already done. In verses 8 through 12, he talks about the way that God did it, just not that God did it, but the psalm writer says, let me tell you what he did, but I can also tell you how he did it and the method and the way that he used you see, it's fresh in his mind. He can recall things written. He can recall the works of God. He can recall how they were done. And in verses 13 through 15, he talks about the communion of partnership through God in it all. And then he declares in verse 16, come in here, come in here, what I have to tell you. You see, his words tell you that his praise is re very real. The words of the psalmist in the first 15 verses, and it culminates in that verse 16, tells you that his praise is real and it's fresh. It's not old. It's not dated. It's not stale. It is fresh within him. Now, I could spend the next few weeks declaring what God has done in my whole life. But I've already given him glory for things that, I did, that he did 20 years ago. I've given him glory for things 10 years ago or 10 days ago. What God wants is for his praise to ever be on my lips, not just some of the time. Now, for him to be ever on my lips, I have to be able to find reasons to praise him, right? I have to be alert and looking actively for God working in my life. 
Number two, a worthy testimony must be of God and not you. Must be of God and not you. You see, this verse, which follows our verse, speaks of God's immense faithfulness and his goodness, his answered prayer, his holy reverence. Everything is dependent upon God's faithful care. And that's the theme of the authorship in Psalm 66. You see, you're right to shrink from telling a story about yourself, but we cannot hesitate to tell the story of God's grace and God's mercy. So often we want to interject ourselves into the story. I did this, so God did that. I did this, and so God did that. No, it's this. God did that. God did that. God did that. Amen? A worthy testimony must be aware of the audience. Now, technically, God is our only audience, and everyone else just gets to hear you talk about your God. I did a worship CD a couple of years ago, and God gave me the title Soliloquy for that CD. Now, if you're familiar at all with Shakespeare plays or uh, most plays like that, Shakespeare used a soliloquy from one of his main characters on stage when the play was performed. And a soliloquy is a one man or one woman speech where other characters on stage are sort of frozen at that moment. They could be handing him a piece of paper, but that character freezes. And the only thing that you see is the main character delivering his inner thoughts. And you as the audience are the only people who supposedly hear it, where everyone else on stage has dimmed to the sidelines. They really, in essence, are hearing what the soliloquy is all about. But really, truly, that's a picture of what God did in me for this worship CD. He was my only audience. And this worship CD is just to glorify him. It is me sitting down at a piano and glorifying God. Now, those who have the CD will benefit from hearing it, maybe. They might enjoy listening to it. But my only audience at that time was God. And when we have a testimony, it's the same way. We have to keep in mind that God is the audience. I don't want to be talking about myself. I, don't want to, I hear a lot of testimonies that go like this. I just want to testify that God took care of me. Because Satan was after me. Oh, Satan did this, and the enemy did that, and he had me down, and the enemy did this, and Satan did that. Uh, if God is my audience, I don't need to tell him about Satan. I want to tell him about himself. I want to testify to God. It's always fitting to give a good testimony. And we don't want to, we have to be cautioned not to throw our testimonies out there just to anybody because we're cautioned in Matthew chapter 7 not to give what is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before the swine. What are your pearls? The things that are precious. What's precious to you? The testimony of God and the way that God works. This is why the psalmist in, in Psalm 66, in the verse we read in verse 16, says, Come in here, all who fear God. You see, there was a very specific audience. All who fear God, come and see and let me declare. Because he didn't want to just cast his pearls before any old swine. Number four. A worthy testimony need not be monumental in scale. In fact, it may appear absolutely mundane and ordinary to some. Our author simply says that he wants to say, he wants to share what God has done for a soul. It, it's really just a testimony about what God has done on your behalf. It's important that we understand the imprint of God on our lives. Now, a dead giveaway about your telling the testimony that it's from God and about God is when you can pull a scripture to match it. So here's, here's a story I'm going to tell you. A friend and I were going out 
on, a, on her boat last Tuesday. We were, had just decided, decided to take a day and spend the day on the lake to give us both a breath from everything that was going on just to get us away. And we had decided the night before what we were going to take, who was going to bring what. She pulled out paper plates and napkins to take along with us. I got my you know, lake bag ready with bathing suit and cover up and all those sorts of things. And we're ready to go. And Tuesday morning, I wake up, and I, and I just get the sense we're not supposed to go. That's it. I just get the sense we weren't supposed to go. So I called her, and I, or I texted her. I said, you know what? Uh, I don't think we're supposed to go. Why not? Don't know. I just feel like the Lord said we're not supposed to go. And she said, I trust that, so let's not go. And we didn't go. And then we waited for the answer, for the understanding as to why we weren't supposed to go on the lake that day. Maybe a storm would arise that afternoon. Maybe I was supposed to be at the office because I was going to have uh, a ministry need that came in I was going to take care of and be a part of. Maybe it was her ministry that, that she needed that, to be home, uh, to be available for someone else. So we went all day through Tuesday, nothing. Wednesday, nothing, no understanding. Thursday, we'd pretty much forgotten the fact that we were supposed to go out Tuesday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's forgotten. It's, it's in the past. Sunday, she and her husband go out on the boat. And not 10 minutes, uh, even five minutes out on the boat, the boat stops working. The motor completely stops. Now, her husband is fitted with wisdom by God. And he was able to figure out what the problem was, and within an hour or so, was able to repair the boat and go on their way. But had my friend and I gone out on the boat on that Tuesday like we were supposed to, we would have been stranded, and on a Tuesday afternoon, there is hardly anyone on the lake. They went out on Sunday where there were plenty of boats and friends with other boats who were out there. They were closer to the dock than, than, than we probably would have been. And God spared his two daughters from being stranded on a boat on the lake in the middle of an afternoon where normally when we go out on a Tuesday, we might see three or four other boats and this lake is vast and we would have been lost. We would have had to have been towed in. Uh, get that. God took care of us. All he did was say, don't go. And we obeyed, and God showed off for him. He, we gave him so much glory. We told as many people as we could about what God had done. And here's the scripture. This is Jeremiah in chapter 42. It says, so that the Lord your God would show us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. You see, when you get to testify and you wonder if it's God, there's always a scripture that you can share and edify the body with. If we had not, if we had walked in our own way, we'd have been stranded. But God took care of us. All he said was, don't go. Not a big parade of cloud formations in the sky, not a thundering voice, just a sense in our spirit that we should not have gone onto the lake. And he spared us. Now, yes, you say, well, maybe God wanted you to go and he would have taken care of that part on the engine. He could have. Then he could have showed off for us that way. But I think God wanted to show off in this way to say, I will take care of you. Because you see, when we were praying on Monday and we had talked about going on the boat, my prayer partner and I, this is who I actually went out on the boat with, her watch fell apart and a little teeny tiny pin between the parts of the watch had fallen onto the carpet or on the floor. Impossible to find. We didn't even look for that little piece of that little pin, you know, that's maybe just a half an inch long and the, 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 the size of a pin, right? Gone, gone. We were praying, and I happened to look down, and there was the pin. In plain sight, there was the pin. You see, God was getting ready to show off, not just in a pin, that he found the pin, that he cared enough about a pin, that he gave my eyes an alertness. I wasn't looking for the pin. I just looked down and saw the pin. And it's that same God who says, I'll take care of the pin. I'll take care of the boat. I'll take care of the lake. I'll take care of the trouble. I'll take, uh, it's all him. I just want to tell that story about how he took care of us with the boat. Now, 
I think that there are people who find it, they, they're more free to speak more often about things of the world. Hey, did you see that football game? Hey, I was at that game. I saw that guy run that ball through. Woo, it was exciting. Hey, I was at the airport for the eclipse and saw this amazing eclipse. Wow, I was there. Oh, you should see my son hit that home run on Little League. We are so quick to share things like that. How do I know? Because I, I see Facebook. Well, you should have seen the dinner we prepared last night. Woohoo! What about God? Oh, you should see how much product I sold. I work for this company and I'm all over Facebook with this product. Where's God? We are more apt to speak about what this world offers us and did for us than what God has done for our soul. Now, when we, when God, this is what I want you to see. When God began to reveal himself to us. He didn't send down bookshelves worth of books or theology or the, theologies or lectures. He didn't send outlines to us. He began with a story. And as a matter of fact, he created a beautiful picture of his love at, uh, called creation, the garden, and then he placed man and woman inside that picture. Adam and Eve were the first recipients of God's story. God had a story to tell and he told it in the garden. You see, the Bible is filled with the most powerful stories that we'll ever read or ever see or hear. But it isn't just a storybook. It's a testimony of God to each of us. Now, we are all part of that story. When you give your life over to Jesus and you become a believer, you become a part of his story. You're like the book of Acts at the very last, very last verse with a dot, dot, dot after it. And then your name appears with what, you, what God does for you. Because that's what the book of Acts is all about. It's all about what we know. That's exactly what God expects from us, from each of his followers to, followers to simply share what we know, to testify about his story in our lives, what we've seen him do, what we hear him say, what he did for us. We're just supposed to tell our story for God's purposes and God's sake. We don't have to have the Bible memorized. We don't have to be able to answer every question that's asked. We, we, don't, we can't answer every question that people ask about God. We only have to be willing to share the story of what God did in our life. Sharing the boat story. Sharing the little pin story. We're part of this great story. And we have to be storytellers. Just tell the story. And amazing things happen because you tell the story. What do you mean, Jenny? We all know this verse. But do you know that the reward of telling the story, a story about God in your life, makes you victorious? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. You know it. And they overcame him. Who? The enemy. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, and here it is, by their storytelling. They overcame by telling a story. Now we could say they overcame by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. We can make it super spiritual. We they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Can I just say it's this? We overcome by being storytellers. We overcome by telling a story. Let me tell you what God did yesterday. Let me tell you what God did today. Can I just tell you what God spoke to me? Can I just tell you what he showed me in his word? Can I tell you how good God is because I have these friends or this family? Can I just tell you that God supplied my need? Can I tell you that God saved my soul? Can I tell you about God? It's story time. Listen, it's important if you want to tell a story about what you had last night for dinner and how good the restaurant was or how bad the waiter was. But that doesn't overcome anything. When you tell God's story, you overcome the enemy just by being a storyteller. Can I encourage you to become a storyteller? You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know the, the scriptures. You don't have to know the answers. Just tell your story to somebody today. Just reach out and say, hey, I just want to tell you what God did for me. And then we overcome by our stories. Amen? Oh, this is a beautiful life with God. This is a, a spectacular, astonishing life. And God is painting that picture 
his life with yours, mm, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Fister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.